I'm very happy to introduce Menon Rosario, who is MD, PhD. He a PhD in history of science. Uh, he is actually associate clinical professor at the Department of Psychiatry at the David Jeffrey School of Medicine here at UCLA. And he's also a child psychiatrist, sorry, say child psychiatrist at the St. Louis County Department of Mental Health uh, at Augustus Hawkins Family Mental Health Center. And he will speak about the historical and cultural integration of sex, gender, and sexuality. Thank you. Thank you, Ricky Gapo and Sokjen for inviting me, and especially Anne for arranging everything. So how do I advance the slides here? I have no disclosures. I'm not even making any money from this talk. Um, Thank you, Eric, also for inviting me. But I have to say, this was a bit of a, a bait and switch. We were on a panel on the biological, uh, the biology of gender, and I gave a talk that was mostly about gender, transgender, arguing for how sex, sexuality, and gender are all completely intertwined in the bodies of individual people. Um, and then a month ago, he told me, this is actually an intersex talk. So I'm like, oh, OK, well, let me see if I can adapt this. Um, and so I have way too many slides. But luckily, you're all very smart and know a lot about this. Um, so basically, I'm going to be talking first historically, and then work sort of back and forth from history to current uh, gendered various people, um, and including the hijras in India, and then coming back to the Muche in Mexico. And then just one last slide on clinical implications. And I, the, tomorrow, a group of us will be talking more clinically, and we can talk about specific cases. Um, so I think a lot of you already know this. Um, that the issues of sex, gender, sexuality, all these are terms that are completely new. We've already mentioned that John Money is very re responsible for coming up with these distinctions in the, the mid-20th century. Um, and really, the term that stood around for the most time was hermaphroditism. Um, and hermaphroditism, uh, for those historians here, anybody who's read Foucault, um, and knows about the medicalization of sexuality in the 19th century in Europe. Um, hermaphroditism and variety, a variety of conceptualization of hermaphroditism are at the very base of the medicalization of diverse, non-normal sexualities in the 19th century. And actually, in terms of this, the title of this conference, Beyond the Binary, it, it's, I'm going to try to bust many binaries, because it's not just the male-female binary, it's the sex-gender binary, it's the you know, sex and sexuality binaries. Um, and I'm going to, rather than bring clarity, I'm going to muddy the waters more. So many of you know that the concept of psychosexual hermaphroditism was really central to the medicalization of sexual inversion in the 19th century. Um, starts with sort of medical legal concerns about male prostitution, public sex, corruption of minors, blackmail, murder cases, um, but all around this issue first of the term pederasty from the 18th century into the 19th century. Um, and so the first term that comes up is contrary sexual sensation, contraire sexual empfindung. Uh, German medical terms are, oh, all technical terms are just terrific. Um, so, Johann Kasper, Karl Westphal, and of course Richard von Kraft Ebbing are all thinking in terms of this kind of contrary sexual sensation, some kind of hermaphroditism. Uh, it may be evident in the body. It's more likely some conflict between the, the biology of the brain and the biology of the body. And 
I will just jump ahead that, you know, basically that's still the underlying hypothesis in contemporary work on sexual orientation, that there's some hermaphroditism of the brain, there's some nuclei that are cross-sexed in the brain. Um, and many uh, psychiatrists early on think of inversion as a form of neurodegeneracy um, that includes French Valentin Magnon and Kraft Ebbing with his great ever-growing encyclopedia of uh, the sexual perversion, Psychopathia Sexualis. Um, and as an aside, uh, while well, some medicalizations, histories of, of sexuality in the 19th century would present these people as evil medicalizers, uh, people like Kraft Ebbing really saw themselves as very liberal and trying to wrest the treatment of these sexual perverts or inverts away from church and law and that medicalization was far more enlightened uh, and could afford them more rights. Uh, that inversion theory continued with uh, Carl Heinrich Ulrichs, a lawyer uh, who described earnings and earning in, the female version, um, still working with this inversion model. For him, it's the uh, female soul in a male body or vice versa. But again, he's relying on biology as central to moving a civil rights argument. And so you see all these 19th century cases, they are desperately looking for some sign of somatic hermaphroditism. That there, there's a large clitorises in these female inverts, there's something effeminate about the body of the male inverts, um, there's some effeminiform aspect of male inverts. Um, other versions of inversion are seeing inversion as a variation not as a clear pathology. So uh, British sexologists like Havelock Ellis, along with John Simmons, a homosexual, uh, write a groundbreaking sexual inversion in the late 19th century. Magnus Hirschfeld, homosexual psychiatrist, starts the Institute for Sexual Science and coins this notion of the intermediate sex sexes, sexuelle Zwischenstufen, um, that rather than being pathological, what would have been called inverts or sex perverts were intersexes, really. And that's where the term intersexes will come up. But as you can tell, this notion of sexual inversion encompasses many things that into the 20th century we have broken up into specific different concepts and specific pathology. So it overlaps phenomenology of same-sex attraction, physical hermaphroditism, psychosexual hermaphroditism, gender atypical behavior, uh, transvestitism is only a 20th century term coined by Hirschfeld. The little picture at the bottom, you can't see the title, a manly transvestite in women's clothing at the doctor. Um, and transsexualism, the newest of the medical terms uh, coined by American psychiatrist David Caldwell. Um, all of this stuff you all know, um, and we've already had a little bit of talk about the evolving uh, terminology on intersex. Of course, it starts with hermaphroditism. As Eric mentioned, pseudo-hermaphroditism based on uh, gonadal determination in the 19th century. The term intersex, as far as I know, somebody, the better historian can correct me, uh, is coined by uh, uh, Edwin Prime Stevenson under the pseudonym Savior Maine in a book called The Intersexes from 1908, where he is clearly talking about homosexualism, the term he uses, or Uranianism, quoting uh, uh, Germans, and similisexualism, which he also uses. He uses many terms for what today we would call homosexuality. Um, the book is actually dedicated to Kraft Ebbing. Um, Intersex gets used by biologist Goldschmidt in 1917, and then it starts to become what we think of as related to the term that will become DSD. And even when Hirschfeld uses intersexual, he's talking about this spectrum of sexualities and genders between his notion of the platonic ideal male and the platonic ideal 
female. And in fact, he's, he adopts uh, Prime Stevenson's idea of intersex as, as a spectrum of gender sexualities. Um, intersex, as we've been talking about it in terms of as a replacement of hermaphrodism, pseudo-hermaphrodism comes around in the late 20th century, and then we just talked about DSD in 2005, 2006. I'm going to jump back historically to the era I'm most comfortable with, a 19th century, and uh, a wonderful article by William Hammond uh, from the 19th century. He was a uh, retired U.S. Surgeon General. He was the founder and president of the American Neurological Association and gave a talk at the meeting of the American Neurological Association in New York in 1882, uh, which is all just to say he was not a total quack, uh, because you will think he was from what I tell you about this article. <laughs> And he wrote this article called The Disease of the Scythians, Morbus Feminarum, and Certain Analogous Conditions, where he uh, describes experiences he had amongst the Native Americans, Indians, um, during his time working in um, the American West. And he describes this sort of conversion of males into females, a very curious, well, I talk about curiosity, um, which he, like most of the 19th century and certainly prior doctors, have to go back to the classics to see what did they have to say, um, which he describes as a sort of a form of feminization that had been described in antiquity um, as either a punishment for the violation of the Temple of Venus or as Hippocrates, uh, more physiologically described, although seemingly fancifully, that the uh, Scythians of the Caucasus were forced because of their, or because of excessive horseback riding, irritation of the groin and the genitalia and the testicles, would get swelling of the limbs, um, some text missing, uh, seminal loss and feminization. And so what, um, what Hammond in this article describes are what had been already for many centuries described as the Burdash um, throughout the Americas. Uh, and in the 1990s will be in a contested way called Two Spirit People. Um, and this is like Weewa, one of the best described Two Spirit People from the late 19th century. So these are people who were biologically male, not that they would have known that or used that terminology in the 19th century, um, but took on female roles, teenage years, and did t female typical activity. Um, what Hammond described amongst the Laguna, the Pueblo Indians of Laguna in the mid 19th century was that there were these mujerados, um, but that to quote him, by some means or another, the sex of this person, the mujerado, had been changed from male to female. They behaved in, uh, as women in appearance and dress and in their occupations. And he did, was able to do some physical examinations of these people um, and was expecting some kind of hermaphroditism, um, or at least, as he writes, cryptorchidism. And one of them, he describes having large breasts and abdomen, rounded limbs, shrunken penis. Dang it, the text got cut off. Um, Thimble-sized uh, testicles. Um, and how were these people made up? How did, how did you become a mujerado or a burdash? He found that the natives were very guarded about this. Uh, but he, having watched their function in society amongst the Indians, uh, described it as a mujerado, as an essential person, the Saturnalia or orgies in which these Indians, like the ancient Greeks, Egyptians, and other nations, indulge. He is a chief passive, passive agent in the pederastic ceremonies, which form so important a part of the performances. Um, and from his research, they were created by repeated masturbation, forced horseback riding, so he goes back to Hippocrates, um, that leads to seminal loss, penis and testicle shrinkage and impotence. And then, because of this impotence, 
they take on female roles and are accepted into the community. And as he writes, no disgrace attaches to the condition of the mujerado. He's protected and supported by the pueblo and is held in some sort of honor. And in his article, he concludes, looking at other historical antecedents, uh, describes or cites a case that had just been published by Edward Spitzka, also a noted neurologist of New York, uh, who described a historical case of sexual perversion, who was Lord Cornberry of colonial times, a governor of New York and New Jersey, um, who reportedly dressed up as a woman um, and attended to everybody dressed as a woman. And then he also draws in to the same context of the mujerado, hermaphrodite, something or the other from uh, the Indians, uh, that these were similar to French and German cases that had been published recently in the medical literature as cases of contrary sexual sensation. And I'm going to just give a couple more examples of how this idea continues. Uh, Freud, of course, uses sexual inversion in his major article on the Three Theories of Sexuality, 1910, um, who, even though he uses a sexual invert, he kind of disparages the notion of psychosexual hermaphroditism um, in the case of males, but he's not as sure about women. And he writes, for lesbians, the active inverts with special frequency show the somatic and psychic characters of man. Um, George Henry, later into uh, the 20th century, some of you must know this work, uh, did studies of female inverts and did detailed physical exams. He came up with this interesting te technique of putting a glass plate against women's genitalia to outline them in great detail and trying to show that uh, lesbian women had these masculinized genitalia. So this idea continues into the 20th century. And I'm going to jump um, to South Asia where again, this overlap of hermaphrodite and eunuch and a variety of other historical terms gets overlapped. Um, those of you who travel to anywhere in South Asia have seen what appear to be men dressed up in typical women's clothes. One uh, sort of internet photographer that I just pulled off of labeled this as a cross-dresser. So this is a cross-dresser. It's commonly big on the streets. And this is from Karachi. So the hijra has been shrouded in mystery too, a lot of mythology, uh, many different functions and conflicting functions. Um, they are objects of veneration, worship. They are invited to weddings and the birth of children because they can be, by their performances, uh, confer fertility. Um, they are brought to, again, perform and sing and dance at the birth of newborns and traditionally are supposed to examine the genitalia of the newborn uh, to see what the sex is. And the mythology is that they steal hermaphroditic or gener generally ambiguous children. Uh, on the other hand, the hijras, aside from being venerated, also primarily make their money from engaging in sex work and draw their mythological roots from many, many different places in South Asian uh, religion and, and belief systems. One uh, is as an incarnation of Ardhanari, uh, the merger of Shiva Parvati. This is a sculpture from Lakma over here, um, where like the Greek hermaphroditos, uh, merges the ideal male and female qualities in one body. Um, and like the hijra, uh, is a deity that brings uh, happiness in marriage and fertility. Another source is from the Ramayana, uh, where Rama and his wife, Sita, are exiled for 14 years into the wild, and then this great story and adventures and burning down of Sri Lanka. Um, and uh, the people all love him and go to the edge of the forest before he goes away into the forest. But he turns to them and says, all you men and women go back and you know, continue living your life. Uh, but the hijras, who are neither men nor women, remain there praying, crying, and when he returns, he is so moved by their dedication that he confers on them 
the power to grant blessings of fertility. Um, many other sources, one is that they are devoted to Bahukaramata, one of the many, many female mother uh, deities, um, and one mythology is that she comes to the hijra in a dream um, and lets them know that they are meant to be hijras um, and called on them to undergo nirvan, the surgery that will make them into true hijras. Um, and so the hijra distinguish true hijras um, versus fake hijras and what makes a true hijra is undergoing nirvan, uh, which is a ritual more than a surgery that traditionally is carried out by a senior hijra who acts as a midwife uh, in performing a removal of all of the external genitalia and creating the genitalia of the hijra, a third sex, neither male nor female. This is not about creating female genitalia, this is about creating the genitalia of another sex. Um, the hijras also are connected to from the Muslim period in South Asia, uh, the, zin, the eunuchs of the Zenana, um, Zenana being the, the court of the women, and the eunuchs uh, being allowed to, to, to attend upon the many wives, um, but also sometimes rising to high political power. Um, and Zenana also becomes a term to describe sort of associates of the hijras, uh, the men who cross-dress and perform but can't confer any ritual benefits. Um, and all of the hijras in South Asia belong to various kinship systems, seven houses um, uh, that are very organized, great anthropological work on this. Uh, so one senior guru and her disciples and sub-disciples chelas. And the, the idea is that the hijra leaves behind her family um, and then joins the family of the hijras. So 18th, 19th century British examining this, this institution that has many millennia in South Asia, uh, just like Dr. Hammond examining this interesting, curious condition in uh, Americas, um, translate hijra variously as hermaphrodite, eunuch, sodomite. Um, they ban or criminalize the nirvan, the ritual castration. Um, the hijras are included in the Criminal Tribe Acts of 1871. Um, and it's possible that some of them have been born intersex or hermaphrodite. As I mentioned, the urban myth is that part of the ritual performance of granting fertility uh, when the hijras perform is examining the newborn to see if they're intersex, if they're hermaphrodite, and stealing them away. Uh, so it's widely believed that the majority of hijras are hermaphrodites, uh, which a group of doctors in Pakistan set out to disprove uh, with this study in which they examined 400 hijras from Karachi and Lahore and found that only 0.8% of them had uh, M absent penises, uh, penis and testes, sorry. Um, on, on the article is curious because it only mentioned that they have absent penis and testes, not whether they had an intersex condition. Uh, so with that, they feel comfortable saying that this is a myth that the hijras are uh, hermaphrodites. I'm going to skip this. I probably only have five minutes. Um, but I want to make the point about the politicization of identities uh, for the hijra. So the hijra, as I've said, have always been this third category. They've gained uh, specific rights as a third gender, third sex in India as well as Pakistan, um, but have been increasingly taken to the fold of transsexuals um, and uh, demanded sex reassignment surgery or gender confirming surgery rather than the traditional uh, hijra nirvan. Um, and so conflict within hijra communities within India 
Are hijras their own thing, or are they women? And this ideology of born this way. So are you born a hijra? And what does that mean uh, in terms of what the biology of hijra is? is? Let me jump back to the Americas and the Mushe. Um, and here is Weewa again. So as I mentioned, Berdash uh, was this term used since the 16th century by um, Spanish and Portuguese explorers in the Americas. Some form of this third genderness, and again, that's a contemporary notion, uh, has been described throughout the Americas, from the Alaskas down through the southern tip of the Americas. Um, very different in tiny ways, uh, but with many overlaps in terms of having some kind of third category of something, because neither the term sex or gender would make any sense, certainly not in the 16th century. Um, but again, in confronting these Europeans confronting this institution, they also come up with many terms. Sodomites, afeminados, hermaphrodites, like this hermaphroditos, indios de dos naturas, of two natures, cross dresses, eunuchs, curanderos, also as kind of shamans or witch doctors. Um, and uh, this illustration from a 16th century uh, Belgian work that was translated into, or printed in France, uh, Grand Voyage, uh, describing the Timucua Indians of Florida. And the text reads, in this country there are numerous hermaphrodites, a mixture of both sexes. They're used as beasts of burden. And they would be used to carry the dead from the field of battle, and they'd care for people with contagious diseases. And in this picture, they're iconographically denoted because they're wearing moss skirts rather than the loincloths of the men. Um, much debate about what the role of the hijra was, um, whether they were just attendants on the men in battles, um, and then that's specific in certain ethnographic descriptions. Uh, the Texas Indians, one description says they abound in hermaphrodites, which they call the monagia. Um, did they service lords and priests? Uh, one ethnographer describes malditos oficios de sodomías. Um, were they sacrificed? We have records of that. And in some cases, um, they served themselves as uh, priests or guardians in temples. Um, but one commonality is that they're this other sex that dressed and behaved as women, or as some third sex. So in the ethnographic literature, there's much debate, I don't think I have time for that, um, whether they were, um, they chose this condition themselves, whether they were selected, uh, whether they were there was some premonition and the fetus was selected as a burdash, whether they were chosen in childhood, whether in adolescence or adulthood, uh, whether they were used for sex or just sacrificed, um, how one became a burdash, uh, the Inuit, and this is one I think that in terms of imposing Western perspectives, describe boys who became girls at birth and then returned to being uh, boys at puberty, which sounds a lot like five alpha reductase. Um, in some cases, described in 16th century Peru amongst the Aztec and the Maya, uh, they're inducted as boys. Uh, in some cases, they are just beautiful boys who are raised as girls and married later on. Uh, and in some institutions, it seems like when a family has multiple boys and no girls, a fifth male can be raised as a girl. And I will underline that again because it'll come back again. Um, and in some cases, I'm looking at you, Eric, they're given a choice. What toy do they want to play with? Like you take boy typical toys or girl typical toys, and that'll determine what the child's gender is. 
Um, in some cases, it's mystical visions, mystical visions while they're intoxicated, um, and many reports of uh, male leaders, chiefs, preferring to marry at least one Burdash uh, because they are stronger and will be more uh, sturdy wife laborers. Porque ejercitaban los oficios de mujeres con la robustecidad de hombres. Um, so, let me jump now to more contemporary issues. Very difficult knowing how to translate these old uh, documents into current conditions because there's oftentimes a huge break in terms of any traditions um, across the Americas, mostly because natives were killed. Uh, any native descriptions of traditions were often burnt. Uh, in fact, all the, the descriptions we have of these Burdash third sex people are by Europeans. Um, so the Mushe are a, a, an institution in Oaxaca um, of biological men who uh, dress as girls and will live their lives as girls, uh, although some will not necessarily dress up as, as women. Um, and one Mushe described, you know, sons and daughters get married and leave, um, and then the Mushe is the one who stays to play the role as the, the, the attendant on the parents, and that's why they're highly valued. So in some ways, it's like this ancient tradition of when you've got many boys in the family, somebody has to become a girl. Um, another Mushe describes, I'm not a man, I'm not a woman, I'm a Mushe, and there's a place for everybody in the vineyard of the Lord. Um, and the, again, from tradition, we don't know how far back, but the Mushe, in this kind of syncretic way of the Catholic Church throughout the Americas, uh, in Oaxaca, the Mushe are incorporated into uh, Catholic rituals in Oaxaca. Um, and most of them will take male lovers, some of them will dress up as women, um, some won't necessarily dress up, but just put on makeup. Um, and it's interesting that again, as with the hijras in India, the mushe uh, is a certain kind of appropriation of Western terminology and are beginning to see themselves as transgender rather than their own category. Um, there are also mouches here in the United in the States, in, in Los Angeles. Um, there's one mouché activist, Maritza Sanchez, uh, who dresses a man during the day to work, dresses a woman at home, has a straight male lover, and competes in drag shows. Um, and indeed, here is Dr. Villain doing field work uh, with the Mouché. No, nobody knew he's an ethnographer. This is at the Mouché Ball here in Los Angeles. And so here's my last slide. Um, so I'm just throwing out just how overlapped all of these issues of hermaphrodites and gender and sexuality are throughout time, and for people, all of these issues that we distinguish as sex, gender, sexuality, sexual orientation are all embodied and natural to them and in terms of the one-on-one -on -one clinical interaction. I think we will talk about this more tomorrow when we can discuss specific cases and certainly having worked in the intersex and DSD clinic at UCLA where we saw many, many kids and families from Mexico, Latin America, uh, and the, the Middle East, um, that this is just who you are. And we make very arbitrary distinctions about, oh no, this is your sex, or this is your gender, or this is your sexual orientation. Uh, so in terms of a clinical appeal uh, to those who work clinically, is to remember that the patient's own experience of all of these things is totally tied together for them, um, and that these distinctions between intersex or transgender um, are also a historically 
evolved a distinction and that we've heard before um, and certainly uh, having spoken with uh, Cheryl Chase at length before, uh, Isna would get many calls from people she would describe as really being transsexual um, and for her she was making that distinction but for that person um, they felt like they could embrace the intersex diagnosis and similarly um, from our DSD clinic I would get referral to people that because of their own cultural background they felt like they wanted to identify or search for a, a hermaphrodite diagnosis which was more legitimate for them than a transsexual diagnosis. Um, and so again just in terms of clinical concern is thinking about each individual's own understanding about sex, gender, sexuality, how those things arbitrarily distinguish for us all fit together in their cultural system of beliefs about those things that we call sex, gender, sexuality, um, and that they have religious implications, spiritual implications for their cultural black backgrounds. And that is it. Thank you. Well, I, I think in at UCLA, uh, working interdisciplinarily, having a geneticist and urologist, and I had been the psychiatrist on there, uh, and the endocrinologist, um, was really important because, I mean, this is a medical institution, and some of the focus is zoom, <laughs> like whoa, let's see what's there. Like, but of course, being a shrink, I mean, I think, what's going up here? <laughs> like, talking to the family, like, how is your child doing? And like, how do you understand what's going on here? What, what are you worried about? What are you concerned about your child? And oftentimes it's, I mean, there's just developmental issues, and we've certainly seen that it, it, in part because of the actual genetic condition, there are developmental issues. Um, and that sort of gets put to the side because the focus is down here. Um, so sometimes that's the major issue for the family. It's like my child is seven and still can't read. Um, and that gets forgotten. Or there's social issues. Um, but also, I mean, some, the, the family's religious background may mean that their bigger concern is the sexual orientation. Again, my interpretation of what that is, that being diagnosed as intersex means he's going to be gay. But that's because they're born again Christian. 